and welcome. My name is Natural Love and I'm the Assistant Director for Community Engagement with the Office for Community and Civic Engagement at UNC Pembroke. Today I'm via WebEx with Dr. Asa A. Revels for the Community Engagement Virtual Workshop Series. Um, so the series, it was designed to emphasize the community partner and student experience by providing networking opportunities and collaboratively engaging in strengths-based efforts to further support the community partnership and UNCP student volunteers. So a little bit about Dr. Asa Rebels. She is the Clinical Trials Research Coordinator at UNC Pembroke, the Executive Director of the local nonprofit organization PAWS Incorporated, and the Program Coordinator of a local nonprofit Stop the Pain. She is a member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina and a graduate of the University of South Carolina, receiving a PhD in public health in the area of health promotion, education, and behavior. Additionally, she has more than eight years of experience in research, evaluation, grant writing, health communication, program development and implementation, and nonprofit administration. Her work has been primarily in the areas of violence and injury prevention, substance use disorders, chronic disease prevention and control, and American Indian communities. So during today's presentation, um, just be prepared to take a deep dive into conversation about her work in the nonprofit field, um, sharing insight about two organizations that she oversees, as well as just hearing about different social issues that she may have faced on the community level and different collaborative efforts that we can all take as a community. All right, Asa, I'm gonna pass it on over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to be here today. Um, I always love sharing about what we're doing here in the community. So um, as Ms. Love said, I'm going to be talking about two of the nonprofits that I have had the opportunity to work with. And uh, the first is Stop the Pain and the second is Pause. And we're going to go into detail about exactly what those two organizations are. So I wanted to first share um, a little bit about myself, you know, how I view health and uh, working in the community because it really influences the way I approach stuff. And again, I'm going to talk about the two organizations. Um, so for me, uh, I'm originally from um, North Carolina, Robinson County, actually, but I grew up in South Dakota. Uh, that's where I spent most, the longest I've ever lived anywhere continuously was in South Dakota. Um, again, I'm a member of the Lumbee Tribe. Um, I have been fortunate enough to attend six different universities um, throughout my educational career. So I've lived kind of all over um, and I've just been really blessed to have a lot of great experiences. Uh, I got my bachelor's in criminology, my master's in public health, as well as my PhD in public health. And so really all of my education really focuses on health behavior or why um, people do the things that they do, whether it's regard to health or crime. My interests, um, I love to garden. I have a garden now. I just picked my very first tomato this morning, so I was really excited about that. Um, I absolutely love coffee. I have my own espresso machine. I call myself a coffee snob. Um, I also love traveling, which has been quite depressing lately because I can't go anywhere, but I'm getting used to staying at home all the time. Uh, I love Starbucks. Um, I've been going to Starbucks for years. Again, part of that coffee snob attitude that I have. Uh, usually for Christmas or birthdays, I get Starbucks gift cards. <laughs> so I don't often pay for Starbucks, so I'm very fortunate. Um, looking at how I view health. So my perspective of health is very much influenced by my cultural background, how I grew up. So um, I actually grew up on a the Lakota Reservation in South Dakota, and this is a photo of a medicine wheel. It was, you know, constructed thousands of years ago. It's in Wyoming, and you can only reach it certain times of the year. It's about uh, two school buses in length or diameter, and you know, as you can see, um, and the Medicine wheel in the corner is uh, another representation of the same thing. And this is the four direction colors, which are significant. You know, it's different for each tribe. This particular image was made from porcupine quills and they're basic, they flatten them out and dye them. Um, and this is a, a technique of sort of beading that was used by the Lakota as well. But essentially, if you look at the medicine wheel, there are different spokes that all meet in the center. And I view that as 
these are all the different things that affect you in your life and your health, um, and they're all interconnected. And that's really how I approach anything that I do in the community or health generally, that there's never just one reason why a person does what they does. There's many factors that play into um, the health of our communities. And just looking at this photo, you can see that this cyclical pattern plays out across nature from the, you know, the atoms that compose our bodies and the blood cells to the shape of the universe, our weather patterns. You can see it in the seasons. So it's a huge part of, you know, the earth, our physical bodies. Even within our culture, you can see different aspects of this uh, cyclical dynamic um, from, you know, the concept of karma, even within the Olympic design. So it's everywhere that you really look. Uh, this is a public health model that I really embrace. Um, and it's really goes back to, again, that there are multiple different things that affect the individual. It's not just the decisions that they make on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the communities that they live in. It's the policies that are developed at the national level. It's uh, the organizations within the communities. It's the cultural norms and values that exist within the community. So just because a person, for instance, may have an addiction problem it's not just because of a decision they made there's multiple factors that play into that uh, these are examples of how this medicine wheel concept um, can be used so this is um, one for foods uh, used by the lakota um, and it's just talking about the four different types of uh, food this is looking at states of being, particularly health. So your physical, emotional, spiritual, and mental health are all interlinked. And when one is out of balance, you know, it's going to affect the others. This is looking at um, recovery from substance use. And these are the four key elements that say that are described as being critical to a person in recovery. So having a stable home, living in a stable community, having optimal health and having purpose in life. Okay, so um, discussing Stop the Pain. Uh, Stop the Pain was originally founded by Michael Wayne Chavis back in 2013. He was a retired state trooper and um, he experienced a lot of traumatic things throughout the course of his job um, and he eventually turn to substances as a way of coping. Um, he was able to go to Wilmington. He went to the Wilmington Treatment Center and get help for his issues and he successfully recovered. And he decided to come back to Robinson County in the community to really try and make a difference because not only was he impacted, but he also saw it all the time uh, within his job. In um, a particular event, uh, this individual, Dwayne Paul Jones, he was a young high school student and he had everything in life going for him and he um, tried drugs one time and it ended up taking his life. And this was a very tragic um, moment in the community. It was really one of the driving forces behind him starting this uh, organization, Stop the Pain. And this was in 2013. And, you know, he started out just going out into the community. He wanted to set up an AA program and he started really the first AA program in the county that was in a church. Uh, if you look around, you know, the United States, the majority of AA programs can be found in churches, but that's not the case here in our community. And he had really received a lot of pushback, but he was eventually able to set one up at Prospect United Methodist Church. And it's probably one of the biggest AA meetings um, in the county. I know they can have up to 40 or 50 participants. Um, it's every Wednesday night at the church and it's been going on for many years and it's very successful. Uh, so today, unfortunately, um, Mr. Chavis passed away tragically in a house fire. I met him through my dissertation research about six months before he passed away and he just had a major impact on my life. He, if you knew him, he's very passionate and you couldn't say no to him. And so um, he asked me to help write a grant for his program. And uh, that's how I got pulled in to stop the pain. And I've just been involved with it ever since. I haven't looked back and particularly when he passed away, I, I just felt obligated to continue and try to make sure that his dream became a reality. 
So uh, today, our our board we have a board of five members, and all of us knew or had some sort of relationship with Mr. Chavis. Uh, but we all have some sort of either personal link to substance use, or it's a part of our professional experience. Uh, so we have a member of the recovery community on our board. Uh, myself, who's in public health, obviously. We have two professional counselors and. One of our members is also a retired jail administrator, and she owns her own business in the community. Um, our mission is saving lives through education and recovery, and we have two primary goals, which is really to raise awareness about substance use and mental health issues in the community and address the stigma. Stigma is a huge issue in the community, so that's something that we want to address and then provide avenues of support you know, for people who are currently in recovery and their families as well. So uh, three of the programs that we have, again, I've mentioned the AA program, it meets every Wednesday night. They also do a Sunday school uh, recovery. So every Sunday they have a specific group of individuals who meet and they, they have specific discussions on religion and recovery. And then one of our counselors, our board members, leads um, what's called the Recovery Assistance Program. It's really more of a talking circle. It doesn't follow any traditional uh, recovery support group model. Um, and that meets every Tuesday nights at the Holiday Inn. And again, because of COVID-19, this has sort of been on hold, but we are, he is posting um, videos every Tuesday at seven on Facebook. and. You know, even if you're not in recovery, his message, I think, you know, extends to anyone who's having a hard time. I know I have definitely benefited a lot from the stuff he's saying. He's, his name's Rocky Lockley. He's very talented at what he does. Another thing that we've done is created this resource guide. So this resource guide started as a two page um, list of resources in the community that I use with my dissertation. So I did my dissertation in uh, drug-related violence among the Lumbee tribe. And as a part of that, when I would interview individuals, I wanted to have something I could give them in case they were struggling with substance use. And so I just had put together this two-page guide. And you know, through my work, I realized that a lot of the community wasn't really familiar with the sort resources that are in the community today. Even the professionals who are working in the field aren't aware of all the programs and myself just trying to get information I was challenged you know and I have a background in research and finding stuff and it was difficult for me to get the information so this guide has went from two pages to over a hundred pages today um, we just released the new edition back in May you can find it on our Facebook page I can also email a link to anyone who's interested uh, but we've gotten a lot of great feedback from the community it is an extensive guide and it's not necessarily friendly for members of recovery but it is really helpful for um, the professionals uh, another thing that we do is community awareness events these are probably one of the favorite things um, my favorite part of stop the pain is we're going out to the different communities and hosting events this is what we did in the town of Renner, obviously, a couple years ago, and it was in uh, memory of someone who lost their lives as a result of um, someone who was under the influence, and it was a really tragic event for this community, and we've done this in Pembroke, we've done this in the Maxton area, and we really try to go out to the small areas where, you know, not a lot of attention is given, where there's really no resources, and we have individuals provide testimonies about how they've been able to recover. We try to have local agencies come out and share information about um, what they're doing and what um, the community could get access to. We always have some sort of um, memorial. So here we lit um, lanterns where the individual could go and write the name of someone they lost. And you know we lit the uh, candles when it got dark that night. And we, you know, we ended it with a talking circle. And so we have, you know, done several of these events um, in the community. They're always very powerful and emotional, and I just really enjoy them. And we always try to feed everyone too. Uh, so we've gotten the, I'm forgetting the name, Stephen Roberts Original Dessert in Pembroke has donated us desserts every year. And we 
almost everyone gets to take home a whole cake afterwards. So it's really, really cool. And we usually have anywhere from 50 to 100 people participate. I think this was one of the most successful events that we had in Renner because we had two people from that community actually take a lead on helping set up the event and we really just provided support. So the individuals from the community really know who to talk to and how to get things done. So we've tried to build that into our strategy um, so these events can be more successful. Now I'm gonna try and play this video. This was one of the largest events we had. We partnered with the university, uh, the Lumbee Tribe and the Burnt Swamp Baptist Association to host what we call a night of recovery or night of healing, I'm sorry. It was just before the um, dance of the spring moon powwow a few years ago. So hopefully this video will play. Doesn't look like it's gonna play. Okay, it won't play, but this is available on our Facebook page. You can see it there. It's really cool. Um, again, same concept. We had a, you know, I think we had like 20 to 30 local agencies come out. We had testimonies. We had music. We did a butterfly release, a candle lighting. So we had food, so it was really powerful. And I think it, and we had over 400 people attend this event. And I just think it goes to show how much of an impact we can make when we're all working together um, to get stuff done versus doing things as individual agencies. Another thing we do is just going out into the community and giving guest lectures, setting up at different events to give out information. Um, this is one of our board members to the left, Jill. Um, this was at a, a Christmas event, again, in the town of Renner, and we have this game called the Wheel of Misfortune, where you can spin the wheel and answer a question. We try to make everything educational and informative and always have something to give away. Um, this is this photo at the top right as us presenting at the Scotland Family Counseling Center. Uh, they had a Silent Samaritan auction, which um, helps fund their agency and the work they do. And they invited us to be speakers at that event. Uh, here's Rocky. Again, he was at uh, one of the local schools providing education for youth. So we do, we've been to Pembroke Day. We try to participate in any local events where we can set up and really give out information um, about the resources in the community and try to educate as much as possible. This was um, an event that we sponsored called the Road to Recovery. It was a pastoral training. Uh, so one thing things that we found through our work and through my research is that and again, I've mentioned this already, is the churches really in the community are not involved in addressing substance use or health generally. And one of the reasons is because uh, they really just don't know what to do. They don't have the education or background, and they're also afraid um, of what it could potentially do to their church. Um, so we set out to host a training to educate these leaders on substance use, where they can access resources. And it was a great event, and it was a, a lot of lessons learned for us. We would have liked to have seen more participants. We only had a few pastors, but we did have a lot of leaders from the church come in, which was great. Uh, but again, it just goes to show you that there's just not a lot of buy-in from our church leadership. And we've really been pushing and trying to change this issue. It's been one of our main focuses. Uh, but we had this um, back in 2019. So it was, uh, again, a learning experience. One of the programs that we have going on right now, which is kind of on hold, is our Recovery Ambassador Program. So this is really going into the different communities identifying individuals who are passionate about substance use or have been impacted by it and want to make a change and really uh, empowering them to take the lead in their community uh, to do that, to make a change, to serve as a resource for community members who may be impacted by substance use. So we put them through a training, we give them our resource guides, we educate them on what's available in, in our county, the services that are available, how they can help, and then we give them uh, money to do their own event and we let them decide, do they wanna have a, an awareness event? Do they wanna sponsor a talking circle? It's really up to them and what they think um, their community needs. And so we only actually were able to recruit two teams um, at this point and then everything was put on hold because of COVID-19. But you know, if you know anybody that's interested in participating, 
we have funds to do 10 communities and we um, actually just submitted or part of another grant that could expand it to even more communities and extend the length of the program. So instead of just doing one event for a year, you can get additional funding to do it for another year. And we also give the ambassadors incentives. We feed them and then they get an incentive, uh, a cash incentive for completing um, their responsibilities. We've been able to participate in the 4th of July parades every year, which are always a lot of fun. We do these little bags with candy and information and throw them out to the crowd. We, I think we did over a thousand, very time consuming, but it's always a lot of fun walking through or riding the float through both Renard and Pembroke and throwing out the candy. We serve on local co uh, coalitions. So we um, sit on the Healthy Robinson Coalition, which is a general health committee, and also the Robinson County Substance Use Coalition. So this is um, a way for us to know what's going on in the county, as well as provide our advice and suggestions on uh, what people or what these agencies can do to improve their efforts. You know, most of us are from the community and we really are more passionate about the community. and a lot of these are attendees are more or less doing this for a job for their job versus us who are really just volunteers. And so we want to make sure that they're there and doing what they're supposed to do. And that way we know what's going on so we can take it back to the community as well. And these are just photos. This is us presenting at one of the um, coalition meetings. And then um, this photo to the left was a great um, meeting where they talked about adverse childhood experiences, which if you don't know about that, I highly suggest that you learn about. It's a very interesting topic. Uh, since COVID-19 hit, a lot of our, pretty much everything we've been doing has been put on hold and we're actually gonna be meeting a couple of weeks to strategize about what we can do moving forward. But one thing we have been able to do is we went out to the community and gave out masks to all of our volunteers. And we went to a couple of the recovery homes and gave them masks as well. We have a fundraiser every Valentine's Day where we sell chocolate covered strawberries. Um, we've been doing this for the last three years and it gets bigger and bigger every year. We did over 4,000 strawberries this past year. We were able to raise, I think almost $3,000 after um, we covered our costs. But again, we try to make everything educational and informative. And so you can see these little tags here in the bottom right. They have not only our contact information, but a list of contact information for uh, local agencies who work in recovery. We were fortunate and enough last year to win a Recovery Warriors Award. So we're very proud of that um, from Southeastern Health for our work, which is awesome. Okay, that's everything for Stop the Pain. So now I'm gonna talk about PAWS. PAWS is a brand new nonprofit um, that just started in Pembroke last year. Um, it's been in existence since 2016, but the founder was more or less just um, contributing monetarily to different agencies in the, in the county. But then he decided he wanted to make it more formal and develop programs. So this is our headquartered office right on Main Street in Pembroke. We also have a church campus, which is right across from the college behind the Sundew gas station. Um, which is a second uh, facility that we have. The mission of PAWS is really to focus on improving the quality and quality of all people in the county, but we're focusing specifically on issues related to mental health, substance use disorders, education, and community resource development and access, which is a lot, uh, but we are doing our best. One of the first things that we have been able to do is start the pause pitch. You can access this on our website at pauseinc.com, pauseinc.com. So we're releasing a, a news article every month on average that discusses, you know, not only what we're doing, but it'll be educational topics as well. We've only done four issues so far, but they're also printed in the Robinson Journal and Native Visions um, every time we release them and they're available on our website as well. On our website, we have set up what's called this re recovery pathway. So I talked about the resource guide earlier and Stop the Pain, and it's a very 
long and overwhelming document and this is hopefully a more simplified version that anyone from the community can access and it's a four-step process about how you go about um, seeking recovery or being successful in your recovery um, one thing that we found out is just people don't know where to start and so this really lays out a step-by-step -step guide and you can click on each step and it tells you what to do it gives you links to resources like um, taking an assessment do you have a problem where can you get treatment and you know once you're out of treatment what is it that you can do we also have an extensive list of scholarships um, summer camps etc on our website so one of our efforts is to really help high school students get into college or develop their career paths. And so we put together this huge list of scholarships you can apply for, as well as a step-by-step -step process of what you need to do to um, enroll in college, to get a scholarship, to build your resume, et cetera. A lot of students think that um, they don't need to start preparing for college until their senior year, or and it's really you need to start right away as soon as possible as a freshman, you know, developing your extracurricular activities, getting employment experience. Um, it's really, this is what really colleges are looking for. So um, a lot of students come to us after they've already graduated and this, a lot of times it's too late for you to apply for most scholarships at that point. So we really wanna try and inform students that they need to start preparing as early as possible. And one of our board members um, this is her area of expertise and she will work one-on-one -on -one with individuals who are looking for support. One of the um, things we're hoping to start soon is at our church campus is hosting just educational classes, whether um, this focuses on health, cultural enrichment, things like budgeting, dance, we wanna do uh, opportunities for youth. So having like military careers come out, college reps, um, our founder is very passionate about autism, so he wants to have like autism day camps. So any sort of educational class we can offer, we're looking to start sponsoring at our church campus, and these will be classes that meet weekly. Again, this is kind of on pause right now because of COVID-19, but I just did get a word from Healthy Robinson sponsors a chronic disease management workshop, and so they're getting ready to start opening up having these courses again. So I'm hoping that we're gonna be able to start having some of these classes in mid to late August. One of the first programs that we were able to do is train seven participants. Um, these are all members of the recovery community who have been um, in recovery for at least a year, a minimum of a year, train them to be peer support specialists. So this is a state certification where um, they really, it's sort of like the sponsor concept in AA where they um, are assigned to an individual and they really help that person walk through their recovery process, whether it's just providing them with emotional support or linking them with the resources that they need. So we've been able to train seven of these individuals. I think three currently have their certification and the other two are still uh, finalizing their training. So. It's uh, 60 hours of training. It's a lot of um, hours. Actually, we have two in there today who are finishing up their final training here in Fayetteville. So we're pretty excited about that. And it's really our goal, I think, to help them get employment, if not work with us and what we're doing eventually um, to provide support to the community. So we just received funding uh, grant funding from two um, local or state agencies, uh, Kate B. Reynolds and the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation have awarded us grants to um, not only support us uh, from an administrative capacity, but also to develop a, a diversion program. And so right now we're really in the planning phases of this program. I think initially when we were looking to do this, we were really focusing on identifying individuals who need assistance and uh, developing a plan for them. So diversion, for those of you aren't aware, is taking a person who has some sort of criminal charge related to substance use or alcohol, and instead of putting them in jail or prison, 
diverting them into treatment um, options, which is really better for them anyway, because sending them to jail is not going to help their issue. And once they get out, they're just going to return to whatever it was they were doing before. So really trying to, you know, prevent that from happening. And so initially, again, our plan was to work with these individuals one on one and di divert them out of the system and try to get them the care that they need. But what we found in the last few weeks uh, doing research is that, you know, there's actually several diversion programs that are in Robinson County already. They exist in different capacities, but now we're thinking, how can we really support these existing programs versus trying to reinvent the wheel? And so we've been meeting with um, the leaders of the coordinators of these programs the last few weeks. And one issue that we consistently hear over and over again is transportation. So um, at the courthouse, they have what's called a DUI, um, DUI court, which is essentially um, anyone who is a chronic DUI offender gets put into this program um, and they go to treatment, they're on strict supervision, et cetera. But one of the issues they're having is that these individuals have to go to treatment or they have to come to the courthouse, but they don't have driver's license. So how is this supposed to happen? It's kind of a contradiction. Um, so addressing issues related to transportation. Uh, so right now we are in the process of working with SEATS, which is the Southeastern Area Transit System, um, and really seeing how we can partner with them to enhance the services that they're already offering. Another issue that comes up a lot is housing. Um, a lot of these individuals don't have stable housing or they're living in a home where, you know, they're exposed to stuff that are not supporting their recovery. And as y'all saw from that model I showed earlier, housing is a critical component of the recovery process. And so looking at how we can support housing in the community, one idea that we are exploring is called Oxford Houses. And it's not, um, like a treatment or a residential facility. It's more or less a home where the individual can rent a room at a low rate. I think it's around 100 bucks and they live in a home with other people of recovery and it's a successful model that's used nationally. And there's actually, you know, many Oxford houses throughout the state of North Carolina, but we don't have any in Robinson County. There's several in Fayetteville. There's some in the Pinehurst area, but there are none in our community, uh, which is really unfortunate. A third component that we're looking at is aftercare. So one of the biggest weaknesses in the community as far as uh, promoting recovery is that, yes, we have detox facilities. We have 30, 60, 90 day treatment facilities. We have counseling centers. But once these individuals are out of these programs, they're kind of just cast back out into the community. There's really no support system for them. So what are the things that we can do to provide them long term support? And one of those things is the peer support specialist expanding these um, support groups like the one that Rocky's leading rap through Stop the Pain. Um, so this is another thing that we're looking at doing. And um, also a lot of these diversion programs have really strict criteria. So the DUI court offered by at the courthouse, you have to be a chronic offender, which means you have to have three DUIs in order to be enrolled in the program. So where does that leave the individual who only has one DUI? Um, through the Department of Social Services, they have what's called family treatment court, where they help individuals who are at risk of losing their children because of a substance use issue. But if you're not at risk of losing your child, then you don't qualify to be in this program. So how can we address those help those individuals who aren't falling into those criteria. So it's leaving out a large percentage of individuals. So that's another area we're looking at with this program. Okay, so that is really an overview of the two nonprofits I work for and the work that we're doing. And I would say also before I ask if you have any questions, if anyone is interested in volunteering, please reach out to us because for Stop the Pain particularly, we are ran and live and die by volunteers. Um, so we're also on the community engagement uh, website. I'm forgetting the name of it right now, it's not coming to me, but uh, we post opportunities on there as well when we have them available. So any questions? No? Okay. I Thank would you. say 
Asa, yeah, can ahead. you um, also share the, um, it was the flyer that you had showed for the church camps and the educational classes that you all do? Yeah. We haven't released this yet. Okay, um, okay. But, but we will. Um, we're still in the planning phases of this right now. Um, our intern, Ms. Cody Pate, developed this flyer for us. She's on the call right now. And uh, as soon as we are have a better idea of when we can actually start these classes, we'll let this flyer go for public. Yeah, thank you. That, I think everything that you said, just with those, those are really awesome. I just think that you're targeting all a lot of different audiences. Yes. I think those are definitely like great opportunities for our area. Yeah, and the church facility is really great. It's an old church and they put a lot of remodeling into it. So it has a kitchen, which will be great for doing uh, cooking demonstrations. It has an auditorium. So if we want to do art stuff, they can do um, pretty much shows in there. There's a lot of potential with that campus. It's a very nice flyer too. So kudos yeah, to Cody. Did great, <laughs> she did a great job. She did very a great good. job. Okay. That is it for me. All right, Asa. Well, I sure thank you um, just for yet again <laughs> sharing the insight that you have about um, your organization um, and really just, you know, shedding light on, on things that I think would be important to our community. Um, as always, I thank you for what you do um, in the community and then your team as well. Um, and I look forward to future collaborations um, with you on numerous projects. I was taking some notes, so you'll be hearing from me soon about um, yeah. maybe just some different ideas um, or collaborations that we could do um, together. Um, so again, I thank you. I thank you thank to um, Jalen and Cody for being on the call today. Um, and this will be available to anyone who didn't have a chance to tune in. Um, it's going to be available on our um, CCE webpage, and that's uncp.edu slash CCE. Um, Ms. Ace's presentation will be on here as well as previous um, presentations that we've had. Um, and I would like to say that um, Ms. Jalen Wynn, she's actually on the call today, but she'll be presenting tomorrow. She's going to talk about um, COVID-19, um, just some resources um, that they're doing at Student Health Services, and also some virtual opportunities. So I'm definitely looking forward to that one. So if you ladies, if you all have time between um, 3 and 4 tomorrow, feel free to join us. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you all so much. And Thank you. I'll see you again soon. Okay. Thank you.